In this video, we will be talking about how to take an obstetric history. The ethos of obstetric care is aiming for a healthy mother and a healthy baby at the end of the pregnancy journey. So this begins right at the start with a good history taking. There are mainly two types of scenarios when an obstetric history would be taken. One, during the mother's booking visit, where this is the mother's first visit to the ONG department after finding out that she is pregnant. The other scenario is when the mother presents herself in the Urgent Obstetrics and Gynecology Center, UOGC, or labor ward with a presenting complaint. In every ONG history, we need to have adequate information about the history of presenting complaint, HPC, and the past obstetric and gynecological history is crucial. The other components remain the same like any other history. Their past medical history, surgical history, what medications they are on, their allergies, their social history, and their family history. Firstly, the history of presenting complaint. Some common HOPCs can include abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, leaking of fluid from the vagina, and reduction of fetal movements. We need to know the details of the problem, such as the onset, duration, and if this is the first time or she had experienced similar episodes. And if so, what was the diagnosis then? Were there any tests performed and was she treated for it previously? This is followed by asking about associated symptoms, such as abdominal pain, any vaginal bleeding or leaking of any fluid vaginally, and if they are in the later part of pregnancy, ask if they feel the fetal movements. As we are taking the HOPC, we should be thinking about our differentials and potential plans. Next, we need to find out all about the current pregnancy, which includes the date of her last menstrual period to determine the gestational age and when she booked. If this is a booking visit history, we can follow up by asking how did they find out about the pregnancy? Was this a planned pregnancy? If not planned, follow up with if they intend to continue with the pregnancy. And if it was not planned, exploration of any contraceptives that were used and education of types of and correct method of using contraceptive for it to be effective and accurate in the future can be part of the plan. And how the method they conceive, whether it was by natural methods or through subfertility treatments. This can be followed by a congratulations to the mother or the couple. If this was not the booking visit, we can ask about the progress of the pregnancy in a systemic order. This can be started out with a general question such as how has the pregnancy been so far? This can be followed by more specific questions on the tests done so far such as whether she had the first trimester screening tests like full blood count, blood grouping and antibody testing, tests for syphilis, HIV, hepatitis B and the thalassemia status of the husband. And did she have a booking for an ultrasound scan? If so, at what gestation and what other relevant findings? And did she opt to perform the Down syndrome testing? such as NIPT or FTS. How was the results? And if she had to undergo any invasive testing like chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis. At week 18 to 20, did she have a screening scan? And if so, were there any concerns raised? And at week 26 to 28, did she have any glucose tolerance test? Dating of pregnancy can be done in two ways. The first way is from the period of amenorrhea and that is using the first day of her last menstrual period. When using a period of amenorrhea, 
you can calculate the expected date of delivery, EDD, by either adding nine months and seven days, which is the natural history, or you could use the pregnancy calculator wheel. If you align the last period arrow with the date that she gives you, the EDD arrow will point to her expected date of delivery. Nowadays, it's even easier. We have a computer software that gives you the due date. The big problem that we would face by using just the last menstrual period to calculate the pregnancy dating would be the reliability. Because if a patient's cycles are irregular, the dates may not be reliable. But if the person has used subfertility treatments like fertility-inducing medications or assisted reproductive techniques, the dating is more reliable. If a person has come off a combined contraceptive pill and got pregnant in the first cycle, those dates may not be reliable. The second way is using an ultrasound scan to date the pregnancy. It's most accurate when done in the first trimester, and we measure the CRL, which is the crown rump length, up to 12 weeks. If the person presents beyond 13 weeks, the head circumference is measured, which gives us the EDD. But you need to be aware that there is a plus or minus one to three weeks error. Now let's move on to the past obstetric history and the obstetric code. There are a few terminologies that are peculiar to obstetrics, which is the G and P status of the mother. G stands for gravida. It means the number of pregnancies irrespective of gestation and sight. Please do not mention the word gravida when the person is not pregnant. For example, a person presenting with a gynecological problem and if she has had two children in the past, you would just say that she is para 2. But a person who is currently pregnant and has had two children in the past, you would mention as Gravida 3, para 2. This includes live birth, miscarriage, TOP, ectopic pregnancies, you may ask the patient, How many babies have you had before? How old are your other children? This may be a sensitive question, but we ask this to every of our patients. Before this, have you had any miscarriages or abortions? When was this and how old were they? Did you go through any procedures then? Any complications then? Which leads us to the next terminology, which is parity or para, which is the number of babies born alive or dead after the period of viability. Generally, more than 500 grams or more than 24 weeks. Miscarriage refers to a loss of pregnancy before the period of viability, while termination is ending pregnancy. So, when a pregnancy has ended before 24 weeks, either as a miscarriage or termination, you should always ask for the gestational age at which it happened. If there are any complications, like bleeding, infection, and if they had to go for evacuation of retained products after the termination or a miscarriage. Now, let's look at the history that you have to elicit for every pregnancy that has gone past 24 weeks, which can be split into antenatal, intrapartum, and postnatal. Antenatal complications include pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, if she had any antenatal admissions in a previous pregnancy and the reasons for the admission, and if there are any other antenatal concerns. For the intrapartum history, we need to know the gestational age of delivery, and if the person had labor, whether it was a spontaneous or induced labor, and the mode of delivery, whether it was a normal vaginal delivery, instrumental delivery, or a cesarean section. 
If it was a Caesarean section, we need to know whether it was a planned Caesarean section or an emergency Caesarean section, the reason for that, and whether there were any intraoperative or postoperative complications. And specifically, we need to ask if there are any special instructions for the next birth. You also need to ask about the postnatal complications like manual removal of placenta, if there was any postpartum hemorrhage or any puerperal infection or sepsis. And also, do not forget the mental health of the women, especially postnatal depression and puerperal psychosis. There is about 2 in 3 chance of recurrence in future pregnancies. Now let's look at the baby details. So for our babies, we need to know the gestational age at which the baby was born, the birth weight of the baby, is the baby currently alive or dead, if dead, at what age the baby died, and what was the cause of death, and if alive, what was the condition of the baby at birth and present. Also, we need to know if there are any congenital anomalies, and if there are, if the anomalies were detected either antenatally or postnatally, and also if there were any neonatal complications, for example, neonatal jaundice which needed admission to the unit or requiring phototherapy. After eliciting a detailed history about the presenting complaint, the present pregnancy, the past obstetric history, we need to move on to the other history like her past history. We need to know the past medical and surgical history with particular emphasis on hypertension and diabetes and if any previous gynecological related surgeries such as uterine surgery or tubal surgeries. Also, ask for any medications she's currently on and if she has any drug allergies and also the social history of smoking, alcohol or substance misuse, and the family history. In particular, ask for diabetes, hypertension or preeclampsia in the family members. So in this presentation, we saw the history that we need to elicit from a pregnant patient. Thank you for listening. Quiz time. Question 1. With regards to confirmation of gestational age during antenatal care, which of the following is incorrect? Question 2. With regards to fetal gestational age during antenatal care, which of the following is correct? Question 3. Routine antenatal maternal screening blood tests include the following except? 